name is Josiah Houston, and I'm a member of Team Hercules here at WPAA-TV. Tonight, I'm honored to be speaking with our guest, Kevin Markowski, as we continue to celebrate his long and storied career as the Record Journal's freelance editorial cartoonist for the last 41 years. Good evening, Kevin. It is a pleasure to be speaking with you again. Great to be here, Josiah. Thank you. Now, what year did you first begin working as a freelance cartoonist for the Record Journal? And when you first began the job, did you see it as a, a long-term commitment or a short-term opportunity? I'm sure I thought of it as a long-term uh, vocation of some kind, you know, on, on whatever level. I probably at that time thought, you know, I knew it was just once a week for the time being, but that I would, would be a springboard to something wider ranging and, you know, more time consuming and lucrative. And many more weeks. <laughs> well, there were many more weeks, but it's still just weekly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as the famous poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Foster reminds us, in everyone's journey through life, there comes a time where two roads will diverge and a choice must be made on which path to follow. Mm -hmm. Now, did you ever consider taking a, a different artistic path or has cartooning always fulfilled your need for a creative outlet? I think it's, to me, it was, you know, I used to say that my art forms were the lowest, like I, in terms of visual arts, it was cartooning and music, it was, you know, rock and roll, and I was a fairly low brow guy. Um, but I think it has scratched the itch uh, just fine for me. I, you know, I wonder sometimes if I'd been more of a risk taker, if I'd ended up, you know, being a full-time visual artist and, you know, branching out beyond cartoons, possibly, but... I think I was, uh, probably still am, a little bit more on the cautious side. So um, I, I've always heard, you know, maximum risk is... Bigger the risk, bigger the reward. And I hear that, and on some level I definitely believe it. But, um, yeah, it was, I think I was a little um, cautious about the risk-taking because there's something comforting about a steady income and knowing how much it's going to be and knowing when your next check is coming. And I guess that's where, uh, you know, I ended up taking whichever of those to the right side, I guess, of that uh, of uh, that fork in the road. But you definitely found a niche, and in that niche you've been able to create some amazing artwork over the last four decades. So great risk, great reward, but cautious risk. Some also, reward still, also yeah, plenty some of reward, reward for and sure. You're too kind to call them, whatever <laughs> you just called them. But uh, it's been really enjoyable, and I can't imagine myself today, you know, what kind of person I'd be if I didn't have this, at least this once a week cartoon you know, working the right side of my brain um, week after week after week through what I refer to as my day job. I mean, I've had four different employers there, but uh, they all started after the Record Journal. I mean, I was essentially, uh, I was working at, you know, temporary agencies, and then I got the Record Journal job, and that's remained a constant through, you know, all these different houses I've lived in and, and other jobs I've done. All those so, iterations and phases of life, the one really the main constant for the longest time has been this weekly cartoon. The one link to a guy with a full head of hair and, you know, uh, Chevy Vega that I used to drive. Oh, wow. Until <laughs> <laughs> the engine warped. I was a Ford Tempo guy oh, yeah, yeah, well. when I had my first beater upper. It was, um, it was basically a large red wagon with a motor put in front of it. Quite yeah. dangerous. Seatbelts, ruined mine, the frosters, nothing really worked mine quite well. Mine wasn't safe either. Now, as you, um, as you look back <clears> over the years... In some ways, I'm sure, I'm positive, Wallingford has changed a great deal, yeah. right? But in other ways, I'm also sure that it's probably stayed the same in, in some capacities. Are there any monumental events in our local history, positive or negative, that you've covered in your work that still stick with you to this day? Um, yeah, the, um, well, there are constants like Mayor Dickinson gets elected every two years and Mary Mashinsky on the even-numbered years and the late Mary Fritz was also a, a, you know, a regular winner of those elections. So when I was looking at the old cartoons, I did find, I went back to those, you know, right after Election Day, it's a natural, it's the one thing everyone's talking about. Yeah. You've got to do the results of the it's election. It's the topic of the week. So, right? yeah, the mayor winning and, and the two Marys winning was over and over. Uh, but the... Um, you know, the issue with the um, Martin Luther King um, holiday not being recognized in this town, and that, was a, that was a big deal. And that year after year, when that date would come around on the calendar, you know, I couldn't think of anything else that was important enough to, uh, to, to supersede that. To overshadow, yeah, to supersede that yeah. conversation. And, you know, I mean, I don't for one minute think that, that racism was behind it or anything, but the perception throughout the rest of the state and the world was, you know, what's wrong with you people? The whole... It's a simple fix. Everybody else yeah. 
you know, recognizes, you know, this great American person for, you know, the, uh, you know, amazing, wonderful person that he was and, and, and gives the work you a holiday. That he did. Absolutely. And I, and I realized it was a, you know, a, a monetary thing and it was, the unions weren't willing to give up a holiday. So it was an additional one. And of course they're sitting back going, you know, we're going to get another holiday. So, you know, uh, I can see what was driving the mayor not to, uh, not to give that day off. But so. I do have a, uh, couple pulled up of your responses to this issue um one being here we have and the mayor's trophy for the scariest costume goes to the kid dressed as a calendar and the calendar obviously representing martin luther king turned to day, day yes with quite a, a quite a scary the other eyeball scary, and hatchet yeah. in the head next to him. well there's some pretty good costumes this person's literally holding their pumpkin head in yeah. their hands still not good enough for first place in wallingford and we have uh another one here which is a little more somber and um, maybe appropriately with a cracked Glass, frame. Yeah, I don't know how I did that. Today, Wallingford Honor is a great leader, and we have Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, another recurring feature we see a lot in these cartoons, this little bird here actually is engaged in the photo, laying down a flower. And just, uh, these ones really, really popped out and spoke to me because I kept seeing some recurring themes in these cartoons. And throughout your career, you've, you've drawn mm -hmm. countless familiar faces from from local and from global politics as you've covered issues like this. Have you ever met any of these personalities in person or do you drive your perspective solely from the Record Journal and other local media? I very rarely met any of the subjects. I mean, um, you know, I've drawn the mayor, I don't know, a hundred times or more I haven't met him. You've never um, met the mayor? No, I invited him to a, um, uh, when I was celebrating 25 years, there was a gallery so a long, long time ago when you were only celebrating 25 only years. 25 years, a quarter, quarter century of uh, Wallingford cartoons. <laughs> Back when you were a kid, yeah. Yeah, he, he didn't come to the, uh, to the opening. I've met Tim Ryan. I've drawn him a few times, although I don't think I've labeled him. Tim, I believe, is still director of economic development in the town, I think. But he used to work for the Record Journal in circulation, okay. and so I knew him from those days, going to Record Journal parties and things. Um, but the, uh, my very first cartoon um, in 1980, on March 1st, was of David Gessert, who I believe at the time was on the town council. Um, he was the big bad wolf and he was blowing down the housing authority. And, you know, I was 22. I didn't have a real job yet. I still lived with my parents and he called me up that day <laughs> and at my parents' house. You know, my father gives me the phone and he said, hey, oh, your dad it's answered for us. <laughs> it's right. the big bad wolf. And he was so good natured about it. And I didn't know how people would take it because I hadn't done that before. I mean, I did uh, cartoons for four years in college, but uh, never of this type, so they weren't commentary really, and they weren't uh, the subjects weren't recognizable people. I don't think I even did the president of, of the school. Ah, one time I did a couple professors, but um, in a good natured way. But rarely was there an opportunity for someone that you had drawn and put uh, their image out in public to track you down and speak to your father. No, on the but phone. It, but it sure didn't take didn't take long. It was the first cartoon, and probably a few hours after the paper got thrown on everyone's front porch, the phone's ringing, and he was. He was fine about it. He was really, really was, good about was it. Was that a sign of things to come as you kept drawing cartoons? Did more people seek you out? And I, yeah, I've had, um, I mean, they're not saying all positive. There have been, you know, people had an issue with uh, drawing now and then. But, um, you know, for the most part, when someone seeks me out, it's, uh, it's a positive comment. And um, sometimes to uh, purchase an original. Um, I've had uh, family members of, of people, uh, subjects of the, of the cartoons, seek, buy it as a seek gift. you out and find yeah, it. Yeah, maybe um, without letting the, the you know, the, I've had a, a father, I've had a mother of someone, I've had um, staffers for Rosa DeLauro recently oh, wow. decided that uh, they wanted to make a, a purchase of, I, I did a, you know, one of my full color cartoons uh, in recent well, years. That makes sense since Rosa DeLauro is known for having a very colorful purple streak and in her hair. So in this cartoon, she becomes uh, chair of appropriations and everybody's got purple hair at the Capitol all of a sudden. So apparently she loved it, which- Of course she did. Which, <laughs> right, which She's a uh, fashion set setter, you know? right. she's a trendsetter in this cartoon. Um, so a couple of her staffers uh, contacted me, actually came to my house, um, bought my original and uh, gave it to her as a gift, as a birthday gift. Um, so when she's on TV, I always, try to see if she's ever in her office, which I haven't seen. And I mean, see if it's posted, on a if it's hanging somewhere. Or is, it, or is it tucked away in a drawer? It's probably somewhere. in her bedroom on her nightstand. <laughs> I'll bet you're yeah. something she can look at every single day, the, <laughs> the cartoon I did. Now, while 
um, getting ready for these interviews with the Hercules team, we viewed countless sketches and really tried to do a deep dive into your, your career's work. Um, I've noticed that some characters tend to reappear and, and reappear throughout the years, including the uh, infamous Cicadas, who yeah. just woke up from a quick 17-year nap to rejoin us once again. As you continue to observe Wallingford over, over the years, are there any patterns about our town that you've seen emerge over time? Well, it's um, certainly when election time comes around, it's Republican-dominated. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I, uh, also, when I was digging through these old cartoons, I found one from, I guess, 1984, which was the midterm elections when Reagan was president, mm -hmm. and the local Republicans are all bruised and beat up, and they're holding torn coattails and saying, well, you're, you're, you know, wear a cheap coat or your coattails didn't last or something. So I don't even remember this, but apparently Democrats had a really good result in the 19, I think it was 84 election. Uh, no, no, that would be a presidential. It would have been 82 or 86, right? Yep. 82 and 86 would have been the midterms because 80 right. and 84. So it was one of those years. Yeah. And so I don't remember that, that, you know, there was a you know, popular Republican president that uh, um, in the, I guess they would be statewide elections, so state reps. So they, took a, they took a beating that year senator. in the midterms. It looks like Democrats. I'll have to look that up and find out. So there's uh, apparently one year where the Democrats really did well <laughs> in Connecticut <laughs> yeah. and in Wallingford. Yeah. And it was before I was born. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's a different era. Hopefully one that, you know, might not be so far in the past forever. Now, another recurring character besides the cicadas, which have come back to join us and we've seen in some of your cartoons, is a character that we've never had to experience before, but we've experienced a lot of in the last uh, 18 months, which is the recurring character of COVID itself. Yeah. Um, in these trying times, it was really important for us to ask, what do you think the role of humor is? Is it to make us laugh, or is it to use comedy to push for social awareness and change, or is it really some complicated combination it of is, the two? It is a, a combination of the two, but I think um, more of the latter. I mean, I, you know, it's, I mean, it's not a thing to make fun of, certainly. Um, but, you know, I did um, at least one or two on, you know, the, the reluctance to wear a mask. I mean, you know, that to me is insanity because... Um, you know, it's for the good of everybody that you, that you put that mask on when we're in a um, infectious pandemic like this. So, you know, I didn't really have much patience for people who claim their their rights were being violated because and still are from, because yeah. the Delta variant's coming back and the mask sure issues come right and back I'm, into and the my public. wife's got me wearing a mask when I go to Stop and Shop now. Yep. But um, you know, I guess I'm a little bit more um, open-minded about the people who don't want to get the vaccine. I, I oppose it. I got the vaccine as soon as I could. And because I worked at a hospital, I got both my shots in January. Naturally, so I was yeah. like the earliest one, a full believer in the vaccine. But I guess there are some people uh, with, you know, reasons that maybe I could understand a little bit, but the, the masking um, makes no sense. I mean, how hard is that? Are you really that, you know, needy that you can't put a mask on and, and prevent the spread of this, you know, killer? And uh, for a lot of people, when they're directed or they're confronted rather with a logical um, defense of why something should be happening or with they're bombarded with, with facts, it's easier to, to turn that away and say, oh, I just don't disagree with that. But there's something about humor, something about comedy that sometimes can really cut through to the core of an disarm, issue. It can disarm a person maybe. Um, hopefully, I mean, you know, uh, it's, first of all, you got to get them to see it as amusing. And if they're... If, if my message is so opposed to what they believe, they're probably not going to They find might not it. see the, the, the humor yeah, in it. But humor can disarm um, a person and, you know, maybe open a mind. Uh, There's a universal quality to comedy that it, it can definitely, at its extremes, still push us further apart. But there's something about a, a single one-panel cartoon that has a, a universal quality where there, if you take the time to look at it, sometimes there's, there's an avenue in there for everyone. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's always really interesting for me to hear how people who, who delve and work in humor that have to deal with topical and polarizing issues and how they walk that, that, that um, tightrope, how they walk that balance beam between controversy and caring and while still trying to put a smile on your face. Yeah, and I think one of the um, – something important to keep in mind is, you know, not to be too mean with it, you know, mm. not to be, not to, you know gentle mockery uh, as opposed to um, – you know, just uh, uh, insulting type of mockery. You know, I try not to ever go down that road. So you're very careful about tone. Try to be, yeah. yeah. 
Because there's something about tone that can really that can make a joke that is inclusive feel like it's actually ostracizing in some aspect. And I would it, say it, you're right. It's a complicated line to walk, but that's one of the reasons why it was such an important question for us to ask because it's it something that a lot of people are wrestling with right now with with comedians and cancel culture, and it's it's a conversation that a lot of people are having. So it, this is part of that world, but it's also part of that world that gets to go in it one one panel at a time. So I was just curious whether or not you you felt similar, and in that regard now. We've discussed a little bit of our, our long-serving mayor, who has been, how many years now has he been? I think it's 38. So it? Al- I think not even is. as long as you've been drawing cartoons, oh, but no. almost. No, because um, this cartoon is from, I guess, 1983, and uh, Rocco Vambaco was mayor at that time, and I did draw him several times, quite so a few you've, times. So you've, the... through, you, you've drawn through eight presidential administrations and two, two mayoral administrations. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. They don't um, have term limits here. Now, when you do draw the, the current mayor, not the former mayor, I'm not sure what the features on the former mayor were that were so iconic, but for our current mayor, it's definitely the, the famous hairdo and eyebrows that, that are really emphasized every time he, he appears, very trademark features. Um, how do you pick the features you want to emphasize in a cartoon, or do you prefer to draw instinctively, focusing on the message, and let the, the reader pick and choose what they want to I, take I from I do it. try to draw caricatures that where the person's recognizable, no matter what they're saying or what, what context they're in. But um, the, the context often helps. And, you know, a sign that, that on his desk that's got his name tells you who he is. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the mayor, I mean, he's, uh, he's got his hair part in the middle, and not that many people do these days. So that's maybe his It's a bit trademark. of an iconic trademark yeah. look. Yeah, but otherwise, I mean, he's a um, fairly normal-looking guy, so he's not that easy to draw. Um, I've noticed that the uh, the same the same eyebrow approach you've you've had from Dickinson was was carried over into your your COVID interpretation where you have the and it's the fuzz not on purpose not obviously to be any but just the, the the fuzzy eyebrows and for some reason personally I I looked at a lot of cartoons and all your characters that had eyebrows for some reason made me laugh a little more okay, well, so <laughs> that's it's probably just a personal thing I just find eyebrows funny yeah but they can be very expressive. It, they they really do allow you to take someone's face in a cartoon and add so much more expression, and maybe that's why I'm always drawn to the eyebrows. But I find them emphasized in cartoons that I'm I'm laughing at. And I was just wondering if that was ever on purpose or if it's just my personal my personal uh, subconsciously, I suppose. <laughs> you know, um, but yes, eyebrow. I mean, now when, when people wear face masks, you look to their eyes to know if they're smiling, mm. and I guess the eyebrows probably pay, play a more prominent role now that. We often cover our faces in public. Well, I know as a, a, a one bald man speaking to another, without these eyebrows, I am a goner. That's they basically <laughs> provide 90% of my facial expression at this point. Um, to, to try to have a conversation even over text message without utilize, utilizing my eyebrows, I'm, I'm struggling with one hand behind my back. But perhaps the most recognizable character to return to this, this theme we've been talking about in your work is, is that of a small bird, which... Uh, we, from from what we can tell, it appears in every single cartoon that we've looked at throughout the years, and in various cartoons, he's 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 doing various things. Now, before going into what he's doing in this cartoon, I guess my question is: Do you draw this bird? Who I'm not sure if he's named or, or unnamed, but do you draw this bird with any specific intention of highlighting an important detail, or is it more of an an artist's signature? Well, it's become a signature, so I've got to include him. Um, whether he's uh, integral to the image or not, he's, you know, and it's just people who aren't familiar with him will see a cartoon and maybe I mean, you know, you're inside the public library and there's a bird in there. Well, there aren't birds in the library. Yeah. <laughs> so they'll say, why did you draw a bird there? But um, and the, way, the way he developed was um, in that very first cartoon. Again, he has no name. Officially, he's never. We there was going to be a contest to name him about 30 years ago. The bureau chief and I were talking about it, and I think maybe the editorial board nixed it or something. Oh, that's a shame. That would have been fun. I mean, I guess I think of him as Wally, <laughs> just be to be named after Wallingford. Um, and I do, you know, in all the other illustrations I've done, all the cartooning I've done that's not for the Record Journal, the bird's not in it. Oh, he's okay. Only in the Wallingford. So he cartoon. really is Wally. Then yes, in your heck, he's, he's, he's a Wallingford rep, um, representation. Right. He's specific to Wallingford subject matter. Um, I forgot him twice. Okay. Um, and both times I put extra birds in the following week and made a little note about it. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that I missed him. I just accidentally did twice, maybe because it was a late night. So, so two times in 40, 41, 41 years, years, weekly, only two times that he, he didn't make the grade. Plus, yeah, cartoons. 
Now, throughout your career, have you found that this bird signature, even though it wasn't in perhaps intended to, he's developed a larger meaning, not only with you, but with your audience? I think so, because um, people I haven't seen for many years that still live locally, you know, I grew up in Meriden, um, like in Facebook, I've, you know, been reconnected with people I haven't seen. I'm literally in almost 50 years. Um, and I've had people commenting, I love that bird, you know. <laughs> so I, people notice it, I guess. Um, you know, and he's, uh, as you said, sometimes he's, like he's giving a baby a pacifier, the baby being a little power plant, a pacifier there. For and the, this one, he's doing the exact same motion. He's giving but he's, a he's, rose, or he's holding a flower at the Such a different of, meaning, right? The yeah. same exact action, the same exact right. pose. He's holding a flower in one and a pacifier in the other. Just a couple years apart. A yeah. couple years apart, but they do completely, they have different comments and completely different tones. But the bird is literally doing almost the same thing with a slight Yeah, I felt change. I needed him in the Martin Luther King one. Um, not necessarily here, but just sort of funny. Give The baby dropped his pacifier, you know, we hand it to him. But, you know, if he's um, usually, I mean, sometimes he's back in a tree in the distance. And you yeah, a lot of see times. Him, but he's there. He's there, but he's yeah. even looks like hidden away or on top of something, just watching. And other times he's much more involved. Well, I think I've had him speak four times. I remember the first time I had him speak, it was, you know, 15 years or maybe maybe longer. Might have been more because I found a, a clipping, a newspaper clipping with him holding a disclaimer for a cartoon about hamsters sometime in the 80s. I it's know. it's over in a folder somewhere. <laughs> but he's he's just he's holding a a three line disclaimer that and I had never seen him speak from the other cartoons that I had been looking. Well, through. I'm talking about he's 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 actually got a speech balloon over his head balloon. and he's saying something. So while he is capable of speech in, three in or your. Four. I guess he is. In your creation but it's of probably been a decade since he said anything, so maybe... Uh, so he's gone mute for... Maybe a, I'll have to say hello to you in uh, <laughs> the coming weeks. Well, in, in some cartoons, you see Wally. Can I refer to him as yeah, Wally? Yeah, sure. I mean, awesome. it's out now. The, we've, we've accidentally the named whole him world for, knows. for the yeah. whole world to know. Um, I've seen Wally in some cartoons recently wearing a mask, yeah. being mask conscious. Oh, for sure, yeah. And what, without it even being in the forefront of the picture or the, the, the purpose of the picture... Just setting a good example. Just setting a good example yeah. as a town representative. I've seen him doing a lot of small actions that don't supersede what the message of the panel is about, but really try to, it seems, highlight a specific vantage point. And I was curious if he represented for you a, a type of perspective on town issues, or is he more of an extension of, of your voice, but in a quiet, Probably visual more, way? Yeah, I mean, I, I bet I've drawn him... Um giving the opposing view maybe I, I think I've probably drawn him representing the opposite of my own opinion oh interesting um, I think I have but um, that's probably worth my you know as I'm breaking out all these boxes full of old work I'm gonna flip through them and see if that's true I think I think I've done that it gives and you an opportunity for self-analyzing right <laughs> what have I been doing all this time <laughs> has it been on purpose or not? I, I don't, and I don't know. And be until I saw them all together <laughs> like this. I mean, 17 years ago when I had the, the 25 years show, I did gather them and, you know, saw them from that many different years. You know, side by side cartoons that could be 20 years apart. Um, and I see differences more than similarities, I think, um, and a progression in my own style. But um, I, I until I did that for you. Uh, I haven't thought about that in a long time. So, you know, it's, where was I coming from 20, 25 years ago, and am I still coming from that Where place? did you end up, and are you still coming from the same yeah. place now that you've ended up where you are? I, I have to say, one of, one of my favorite things about Wally, which we've named now officially, Wally is the fact that he, he doesn't take the center stage, but he always seems fully engaged in what the conversation that's happening. Even as I was just turning to the side and just noticing where he was positioned in each of these pictures, it's almost like you follow, you look for, when you can see him, you look for him to see where his gaze is going, or at least I do. And when I look at him in all these, he, he draws me, he draws my eye and tells me where to look. He looked a little different back in 1982. A little storkier. He's got a longer <laughs> neck. He's always had a long neck. I don't yeah? think birds really have necks like that. But... He's got this, this really long squiggle, just yeah. like a, a squiggle line. Yeah? Yeah. That, are necks hard to draw? No. Is that why? No, I, I can draw necks okay. I can't draw hands. Hands I've are had, the hardest, right? I've had right? a lot of trouble with hands over the years. Now, cartoon, I know that drawing anatomically correct hands is like drawing a perfect circle. It's one of those nearly impossible things that the masters can do. You're not supposed to do it anatomically correct in a cartoon, I don't think. So can Mickey Mouse hands more so? or Well, that where they have three fingers and a thumb? Mm -hmm. 
I did that for many years. And then one day I just said, that's for animators. You know, I, there's no reason for me to draw. People have four fingers and a thumb. So I think, I guess when I first started, they were, they were three. No, I think I went to three and a thumb. And maybe 15 years later, I said, I abandoned that. I said that. So if we notice while looking through pictures throughout the years that some of them are adding digits and subtracting It'll digits. It'll be consistent, though. There was a phase <laughs> when they were, you know, the total of four and then, then a, back to a total back of five to a total digits of on a hand. All right. I don't think it made the hands any easier to draw when there were, when there were fewer digits. For me. When you're choosing where Wally is going to be, just for my own personal, because I, I, I have this theory that I've been telling people where I really think that he's specifically drawn in a way to guide the, the audience, the viewer who's looking at the cartoon, where they should be looking. When, when, he's, when he's prominently, when he's not like in the background. I and never just, thought of that, but I think you're right. Because I, I, I feel like it's unconscious, you unconsciously thing. saying, hey, this is going on over here. He's yeah. just as hypnotized as he is. Right. Hey, look what's happening up here. It just, I feel like you're drawing, you're, it's a reminder, a signal, like if you can't figure out where to look, Wally will let you know. But that's, I'm, I, it's my personal theory. I think on... you're right. And thank you for pointing that out because uh, I'm aware of it now. <laughs> you know, something that um, I, I almost mentioned a little while ago was when I drew the first uh, cartoon, there's a bird on the roof, and the, you know, to, to um, illustrate how the big bad wolf's breath was so strong, you know, the bird's feathers were flying off, right, and he right. was leaning back. And then, I didn't draw a bird the next week, uh, I didn't intentionally, but it was a classroom, so I had an owl, and then um, I think the third week, I just had someone with an open um, oven, and a, you know, deceased chicken or turkey or something was in there. And then, four weeks in, my aunt told me uh, that my cousin, who was only, I think, um, 12, 10 or 12 years old at the time. He really liked the bird in that first cartoon. Ah. So I went back and said, bird, hey, maybe I'll put a bird every week. And I, and I had accidentally put birds in. So for a while, my own rule was a bird of some kind. Right. So there might have been a dove. Um, there might have been um, an eagle. But then I settled on this little black bird, Wally. But that chicken little one does that have wally in it i think the I, chicken was the, the bird chicken was the only bird that and is what's in that the photo. year on that 1989 so even that far into my record journal career i was bending the rule you know i mean the rule was there's got to be a bird. a bird yeah but um but sometimes it didn't, it didn't wally have to be would call in a cousin yeah, right. or an uncle to, yeah. he's got to do some work for him so he can take a vacation and mm -hmm. get his, his safe time in so i would just like to thank you one more time for coming here for sharing all of this work with us for sharing your insights and your advice from your long and storied career. We are so proud to be able to do this deep dive with you and to look back at all of these stories and these comments and these, this local history about our town that otherwise we might have very little context for. As someone who was born in 86, who's doing this program with kids that are, were born in the 90s or after, there's very little about Wallingford we know that pushes back beyond our, uh, our personal understanding. So to sit at the table and to ask questions and to learn things about the town we all live in and we don't fully understand, I think that you've, you've uh, created a portal for us this week and I'm hoping that through our conversations and this um, deep dive into your work, we can create that portal for everyone here in the town of Wallingford. So. Sounds wonderful. Thanks so much for having me because this has been a thrill. I've never done this sort of thing before. And this it's our pleasure Very that you're rewarding. able to do it here with us. So you're able to hear do it locally with Team Hercules at WPA TV. Kevin Markowski, we celebrate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you at home.